Hello, hello everyone. Hi, and thank you for joining us. Welcome to live Google Pay integrations on Android, where we complete Google Pay integrations, sometimes on our own and other times with guests. My name is Jose, and I'm a developer relations engineer with Google Pay, and I'll be your host today, together with Tommy. Hey, Tommy, how are you doing? Have you recovered from the previous episode already? Hey, Jose, how's it going? Yeah. Um... I think it was awesome. Um, hi everyone, I'm Domi. I'm a DevRel for payments at Google. Um, yeah, I enjoyed it very much last time and I'm looking forward to this episode. Let's go for more this time then. And as you already can tell, we have a special guest today. We're joined by Paul Ashes, who works as an engineering manager at Stripe. Paul is here to help us complete a Google Pay integration with Stripe and give you tips for your own integrations while we do that. Paul, do you want to say a few words about yourself? Sure. So first of all, hello, everyone. And hi, Jose and Domi. As Jose said, my name is Paul. I am a, uh, on the developer relations team at Stripe. And uh, if you are unfamiliar with Stripe, which I'm sure there's a few of you who are not, Stripe is basically a, a payments infrastructure company. So even if you have never, uh, uh, we do a lot of things, a lot of different products, you probably know us the best for our payment processing, what we do, which is exactly the thing we're going to be doing today is cooking up a Google Pay integration with Stripe. Right, Jose? That's precisely right. So we are closing the circle. That is, we have the Google Pay side, and then we have now Stripe to process the payments. As you probably know, Google Pay does not process the payment, simply facilitates the process. So to have like a full... A payments working solution, you need a processor. And that's why Paul is joining us, joining us today from Stripe. And so the idea is to explore the multiple paths available to facilitate payments with the Google Pay API. Remember, on Android applications, we have designed these sessions, like the one today, to naturally encounter issues, just like a typical integration would. And we'll love your help when we do get stuck. So thank you for being here with us. Now, to quickly uh, remember or remind ourselves about what we did before in the previous episode, we did complete a new Google Pay integration on Android using modern tools, libraries, and, and new patterns. We haven't added Jetpack Compose yet, but we'll do it on upcoming episodes, as we promised. Concretely, we use the latest version of the Google Pay library, which includes the new Google Pay button view that we announced at Google I.O. this year. And we completed the integration using Kotlin. So today, we'll take that application and we'll build on top of that and connect the integration to Stripe, which we will use to process the payment. We have a few integration paths and use cases planned for today. So Domi, Paul, do you want to share a bit more about the uh, potential integration paths that you've prepared? Yes, let, let me start, Paul, if that's OK. Sure. Um, so yeah, um, I'm sure Paul can say um, a lot more about it. However, most um, the, the, the two integration Stripe supports for Google Pay are um, either through the payment sheet, where you as a merchant, you have all your payment methods, and on top you have a um, Google Pay button, or um, you have another possibility, which is the so-called Google Pay launcher, which helps you to integrate Google Pay when using, for example, when using our dynamic button. So if, for example, you have a, a product, and below the product you want to um, put a button, you uh, mostly will, will go with the Google Pay Launcher. Correct, Paul? That's right. And uh, the payment sheet, which is a little bit different, is a built-in integration by Stripe, which when you call it, it actually brings up a new screen that shows you how you can pay. So the exactly. main difference between the two here is that the Google Pay Launcher is for if you only want to implement Google Pay and nothing else, no other payment methods, whereas the payment sheet allows you to implement payment methods for that uh, Stripe supports. So for instance, if you're in the Netherlands, where I am, uh, you might want to pay with something called Ideal instead, which is a direct bank-to-bank -bank transfer. The payment sheet will do some clever things like determine where you are based on your IP and present to you the payment method that makes the most sense to you. And on top of everything, still, we put Google Pay at the very top because we know that if you're on Android, that's very likely it's a payment method that you're interested in. So if you look at the difference between the two is, do you want just purely Google Pay or do you want to have other payment methods as well. And that's where the payment sheet shines. Understood. Thank you for the intro. And I think we'll get an opportunity to discuss uh, which and why and when. Uh, I, I personally have um, have a few questions to ask there. So thank you for that brief intro. 
Also, if time allows, we'll talk about test cards, we'll talk about webhooks to confirm payments and other topics. It, it really depends on how well we do. If we are as good as uh, in the previous episode, which uh, Domi was able to fly through the integration without any issues, I think <laughs> it was actually zero issues, which I've never seen before. So if, if, um, if, if the previous fate repeats again, um, we may be able to cover uh, more topics. Otherwise, let's, especially let's see. If we see <laughs> let's see. If we see uh, a lot of, uh, if you have uh, special interest on any of those areas, uh, do let us know in the comments. We this is not a, a one-off. Uh, hopefully, uh, definitely not from our end. Hopefully, we we get to um, convince Paul to join us uh, once again if required. Uh, and so, just just keep that in mind. We are here to to help. So, and I'm seeing a lot of new faces already in the chat. So let me take the opportunity to say hi to everyone. And thanks a lot for tuning in. If you are all ready, if our um, guests and hosts are ready, Paul Domi, we can get the integration going from where we left last time. Uh, let's go with the Stripe integration. Let's go. Good to go. All right, then you have the stage. Awesome. So yeah, before we... Um deep dive into Stripe's SDKs. Let's quickly recap on what we did last time. So maybe uh, the first thing to mention here that I'm currently on a, on a branch called Stripe Base. Um, this is in, in order to prepare for the Stripe integration. However, it's actually just um, a slight modification of the actual Android Quick Start application you can find on, on GitHub. Um, I think we showed it last time. Um, it's this application. We have a Java version and we have a Kotlin version. Um, last time we integrated the, the new dynamic button. Um, you can see that by checking the wallet dependency, which should be, yeah, which still should be um, the beta 19 to 0, beta 0, 01. Um, we are in the middle of rolling this out to a stable release in the upcoming weeks. So um, back on the checkout activity. Um, you can see what we did last time was actually to use the new dynamic button, initialize it, and um, display it below the product. So let me, for now, let me just run the application in order to see if, if, everything, if everything still works. I would be disappointed if it didn't run um, with the track record that we have already done. <laughs> Let's see. All right, so let me try to make it as big as possible. So yeah, you can see when I click the dynamic button, the Google page sheet opens, a card is selected with my test account. And you can see I can finish the transaction. And if I check the logs, um, we are logging the uh, example token at the end somewhere. Um, it's yeah, uh, I, I can see it already. Yeah, we log it here, and in case if um, if the payment gateway is configured to be example, uh, what we return is actually a string called a string with the value example payment token. So you can see that um, not much modification to the actual Android Quick Start application. Um, we are we are good to go. We can start integrating um, with, against the Stripe SDKs. Now, uh, as a quick recap, I almost forgot. So the Google Pay button, as you know, um, it, uh, is, is dynamic. So soon it will start to display um, dynamic data like the last four digits of the user's last uh, used card. Uh, it will be able to show the card network icon, like the Visa icon, the MasterCard icon, the Amex icon, and so on and so forth. And you can also configure it to look differently. So for example, at the moment, um, the button is in black, and we can actually change it to to white or light, excuse me, and see if that works. All right, good. So yeah, um, basic application branched away from the Android Quick Start main branch, um, still working, and now we would start with the Stripe integration. Um, yeah, so what, what Paul just mentioned before is super nice. Um, as always with Stripe, because they have a super cool documentation, um, we're going we gonna, to um, read through the documentation and start from there. Um, what, guys, what do you think? Is it OK if we start with the Google Pay Launcher integration? 
Sounds good to me. I'm very happy with that, yes. Awesome, cool. So a uh, uh, quick recap, as Paul said, there is the Google Pay Launcher integ integration. You can find it when um, browsing the Stripe docs and click on the Google Pay as a payment method. If you're interested in, the, in only in the sheet, and we will most likely show an integration for the sheet as well, um, you can go uh, to the more general accept the payment documentation where you can scroll through the Android library integration. Um, maybe one question for Paul. Would it be fair to say, just really to make a clear distinction between when to use the payment sheet and the Google Pay Launcher so that everyone understands, would it be fair to say that if I want to build, let's say if I want to have the most simple checkout option with Stripe with all the payment or with a select number of payment methods already included there, the payment sheet dropping component is the way to go. And if I want to build a checkout form that I want to build um, in a customized fashion, in a bespoke way, the way I, I want it to look like, then I'll, I'll be responsible for adding uh, the card payments and then other forms of payments myself, the way I want them to look, but definitely I'll have to do it myself. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. So the, we designed the payment sheet as basically the easiest way to get started with Stripe on Android. So um, do you want me to just scroll past a screenshot there? We're showing kind of giving an example of what the payment sheet looks like on the right. And as I was saying before, it gives you the option to select between different payment methods that are activated in your account. In this case, there's a card, there's Ideal, I think a SEPA debit as well. Um, the thing is with the payment sheet is that it is the UI isn't as customizable as using the Google Pay launcher, as Jose just said. This is really if you want a drop-in working payment sheet that just does everything for you, then this is what you would use. This is by far the quickest way to get integrated. However, if you if your company's needs are that you have something way more bespoke that looks more like your branding, for instance, and you still want to have the Google Pay button involved in your payment uh, flow, then that's when you would use the Google Pay launcher instead so you can make it look like your own. We, we tried to make the payment sheet look kind of like as unobtrusive and as like neutral as possible. But understandably, if you have uh, you know specific brand guidelines, then there might be a reason why you want to build your own rather than using the payment sheet. Make, I like it. Sense. All right, Dominic. OK, cool. So yeah, then let's start with the Google Pay launcher. Um, and let us follow the documentation to actually verify if, if Stripe's do uh, documentation works. Um, Android manifest, we already have those properties set because um, the Android quick start app um, defines those already. We're going to start with adding the Stripe Android SDK as a dependency. So let's see, maybe here. And then we move on by instantiating the Google Pay Launcher. Let's see. All right, we have some kind of activity. Um, we do have a client secret we need here. Uh, maybe, Paul, you want to quickly tell us about what a, what a client secret is and why, why we need it? Sure. So in, the, uh, in Stripe world, we have a thing called a payment intent, which is literally the uh, intention that you want to make a payment happen, that you want to move funds from one place to another. You can only create a payment intent on the server side, so not on the client. Um, and that's what's required to kind of let Stripe servers know that you want to make this payment go through. Uh, in order to, you first create the payment on your back end, but then there needs to be what's called confirmed on your front end. Then rather than sending the whole payment intent itself to the front end, which could be a security risk because it contains things like the amount that you don't want people to be able to change on your client, we sent through what's called a client secret instead. So on your front end, you will get a client secret. Your client will then basically make a call to Stripe's API saying, I wish to confirm this payment for this amount. Here's the secret key, and here's the publishable key. And then Stripe will be able to say, OK, fine, we're going to attempt to make this payment. So it's one of the, uh, on your back end, you'll have a more keys, which we'll get into later. But this client secret is basically what you need to complete a single payment on your client. Awesome, thank you. So that's a good point, right? We will have a client side implementation today and then a backend side implementation with uh, it will most likely be the secret information like the uh, the intent ID or the secret key as such that we can keep that in a in a place where it's not exposed. Uh, like that's like, like it's the case for client applications, right? 
Yes, correct. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to pass on to Paul, helping us to create the, the backend. But for now, I will start with the client um, client side integration. But yeah, as you can already see from this command in documentation, we need a backend to fetch this uh, client secret, right? OK, uh, so I copied over already to, to um, our activity, the Google Pay launcher um, object and configuration. I don't need this for now because we already have a have a button. So we will uh, we will use reuse the dynamic button we have. Let me also copy over the, the payment configuration for now. I'm missing the pay. Okay, and then. We do have an on-click listener. However, we also already have this one for our other integration, if I remember correctly. Yeah, so mm -hmm. we have an on-click uh, on listener set here on the button already. So um, we can actually maybe create a little helper method. Or actually, let me, let me first copy those two helper methods as well for the callbacks. So those will be called when the payment operation finishes, right? Right. And is that the payment operation on the Google Pay side or the complete payment um, validated by, by Stripe? Um, uh, he, he, here, it's like completely done. OK, so that will mean that I will have received the payment token from Google Pay. I will have sent that. Or actually, the, the library will send that to the Stripe backend. And then the straight backend will respond, and that's what I'm capturing here, right? Yes. That's if where you find out if the payment succeeded or not, basically. Yeah, exactly. So if we if we quickly, if if you if you want uh, scroll down a bit, the documentation will tell you. See here, for example, the on Google Pay result method again. You can see that um, you know payment succeeded, user cancelled, or operation failed. Yeah, Jose, read the docs. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Yeah. So while we are here, actually, let me let me copy already the implementation of the of the on on Google Pay result method, so that we have it, and then we go back to step number two. I think it was um, still step number one. Okay. Um, now, um, since I plan to actually. Um, create a payment intent, intent in order to fetch the client secret on every click of the button, um, I'm, I'm creating a little helper method, uh, which gets triggered when, when the button gets clicked. So let me do that. Let's see. So by the way, um, Paul, will you also be able to return me the publishable key from your backend service? Absolutely, no problem. Should I quickly explain uh, the difference between a publishable key and a secret key? Does that help? Please, go ahead, yes. All right, so uh, for the Stripe API, we have this concept of a secret key and a publishable key. Now, the publishable key is what's used in your client base key to identify your specific Stripe accounts when you make calls client-side to the Stripe API. It's called publishable because it's actually completely safe to share it. It doesn't really matter if someone gets a hold of your publishable key because they can't do anything with it without the conjunction of your secret key. Now, your secret key, now that's the keys to the kingdom. That's the thing that you absolutely have to keep safe because if you don't, you're going to have a bad time. So the secret key uh, on the back end, keep it there, keep it in your environment variables. It comes in two flavors as well, in test mode and in live mode. Pretty self-explanatory. Any op operation you make using a test key, either publishable or, or a secret test key, will not do anything real. It only shows up in your test data on your Stripe account. And then everything your live key obviously is like danger here, here be dragons. That's actually moving real money. So when you're building your uh, integration for Stripe, please do be aware. Yeah, keep your secret key safe at all times. And please use the test key. Don't use the live key. Do not test in production. Got it. Makes sense. Thank you. OK, uh, moving on. So as I said, I'm creating a little helper function here called pay, um, triggered whenever I click the button. And then, as we can see from documentation, we do the same thing, which is um, um, calling this method of the Google Pay Launcher, present for payment intent. intent. And now, um, let's see what, what we missed. I think we are missing some variable. 
the client secret. Let's define it. Um, so we are missing the client secret. We are mi missing the publisher key. Both we will get from Paul's backend service in a second. Um, but otherwise, I think that should be it for the very first step. Let's see. Um, oh, yeah. I forgot on Google Pay Ready method. Um, so Stripe's SDK also supports the is, is Ready to Pay API. Mm, they're giving a callback if Google Pay is actually available for the user. So let me also copy this. And let's see. What else? By the way, if is ready to pay returns false, our recommendation is that you do not show the Google Pay button because that will literally mean that you'll be showing a button to someone that cannot pay with Google Pay. So it will be a, a poor experience for them. And that will um, also mean a poor experience in your application, which uh, you don't want. Yes. OK, and because uh, Jose was curious, we have the implementation of the on Google Pay result method already. And I think we are ready to, to pass it on to Paul. However, actually, now I remember something. We need one more thing, which is actually calling, uh, like at least build out the skeleton on how to call the backend. So uh, and that's one of the reasons why I built uh, the pay method here, because I want to here actually um, call the backend fetch secret and pop key. Um, and I cheated. So this is the only thing I prepared already on the on the Stripe base branch. So um, I do have a little method down here called initialize payment, which will uh, actually call a backend to create a payment intent. So um, let's see what it does. Um, so again, after every click on the button, we call, let me actually show it to you again. Sorry for the heavy scrolling. Um, every click triggers the pay method. Now we are going to call the backend, fetch the client secret and fetch the a, fetch a publisher key in order to um, initiate um, the call to the payment launcher with the client secret. So down on the helper method. And by the way, this is like a copy from over here. Um, not to confuse you, but if you now would switch to the to the um, integration for the sheet, Stripe has a nice documentation on, on how you can call the backend. And just very, very, very briefly, um, here you, you, you can see um, they are using Fuel for networking, and they show you how to call the backend. So what I did is actually I just copied this uh, um, uh, this way of, of, of calling the backend, also for the Google Pay Launcher integration. So again, if you're interested on how this act, uh, works, check the, check the Stripe docs for the payment sheet. Now switching back to the Google Pay Launcher integration. All right. Um, yeah, so don't don't pay too much attention here. We are running this in blocking mode. I'm sure you have your own ways of calling your backend already. Um, we are we are running it in, in, in blocking mode in order to um, make sure we have a result because we need the result of the backend in order to actually start uh, the Google Pay launcher. All right. Um, so I'm I'm actually ca calling an endpoint called slash payment sheet and Paul. In a minute, I will pass it over to you to implement the backend for me. But I forgot one thing. Oh, are we is... doing the payment sheet or we're just doing the Google Pay launcher first? That's a slightly different endpoint. Yeah, sorry. That's that's a mistake. So it should be payment intent. Correct. There we go. But that's a foreshadowing of how easy it's going to be later to convert the two. Yeah, it, it, that was actually from testing. So um, when I tested uh, your, your backend, it's, it, it, uh, the payment sheet endpoint delivered me the same information as the payment intent endpoint. But I guess you can, you can uh, uh, clarify later on uh, what's the difference between those two endpoints. Correct, yeah. Um, OK, just one sec. I need to add the dependencies. I forgot to copy the dependencies. Maybe in the meantime. We can answer Ulukbek's question. 
Uh, where they say, what about using fragments? Can we place code inside fragment instead of activity? You can, so that's something that we have left out of the scope of this integration, the same as networking, as Tommy was just uh, mentioning. Uh, you can use any pattern that you're comfortable or, or that you are using as a good practice in your application or business. There's a sheer amount of patterns uh, that you can use. You can either have your code, if you prefer, in your um, in your views, like you're um, asking, fragments or activities. Our recommendation would be that you abstract that away into whatever pattern you prefer to use, MVC, MVVM, MVP. Uh, you can put that behind a repository. Uh, that's really up to you. We recommend you basically that you follow the Android best practices on this. And or um, if you don't, that you use whatever solution or whatever principles you apply in your application or business. And I hope that answers to let me know otherwise. Thank you for the question, Ulukbek. Any other questions? Also, yeah, we have that a... answers the question about whether this is live or not. Right, uh, that's a good point. Yeah, we we had a question asking whether this is live. It is live indeed. Uh, if um, something is about to happen in the near future, we don't know yet, just like you. And uh, also on that same note, I am Katie Blue. This video will be automatically recorded. So when the live stream finishes, it will be made available on YouTube in this same channel. So Android uh, developers. Uh, quickly, let me take a couple more, if you don't mind, uh, Domi, because I think I'm... we have a couple of interesting questions. Um, Marcus is asking about um, how to tweak the language uh, that the customer is using in, let's, let's say, I assume a Stripe artifacts or a Stripe means or Stripe UI. So concretely, whether the cut reader to, to, so, to show the um, signature or pink information in the language of the customer. Do you have more info on that one, Paul? So uh, might need to clarify the question a little bit here. So I'm not sure by Stripe car reader, do you mean specifically um, the payment sheet we talked about earlier? Are you talking about Stripe terminal, which is the Stripe uh, POS or a point of uh, sale device, which is the one that you actually in the real world hold your card against to. Um, in both cases, it should anyway, um, you should be able to pass in the locale of uh, the device to your card, either the card reader as in the payment sheet or as in a terminal device that should then show everything uh, in the right language. We believe, I believe that we support pretty much almost every single language, but don't quote me on that. But yeah, there should be a parameter you can pass in that just says like locale or something similar. In fact, with the payment sheet, if it's online, um, a lot of the times we try to match the language of the device itself if that information is available. Same goes for if you're on the web. If, the, if your browser says that you are speak a certain language, then we'll try to serve all the content in that language. Thank you. Uh, one last one about Stripe. Contactless connoisseur, I never knew how to pronounce that word, connoisseur, uh, is asking whether the dynamic button of Google Pay can be shown in the payment sheet. So right now, this button is in beta. So this library is in beta, and the dynamic button hasn't been actually released yet. Um, the Stripe SDK on Android, if I'm not mistaken, uses the Google Pay API. Um, I'll let Paul elaborate on that. But I do believe sure. that the expectation is that updates to that library may eventually make it to the Stripe library, and so you should be able to see the, the button. But uh, please, uh, Paul, that if I'm not, if that was not accurate. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. And um, yeah, I don't know about the, the, the dynamic button because I think we're waiting on you guys at Google to uh, implement that. Yeah, we are on it. It's coming. Quickly. All right, we'll let you know, definitely. And um, finally, no worries, Contrales. Thank you for the question. And then um, uh, comments, comments are coming the whole time, so I'm clicking the wrong one sometimes. Truth. Uh, I'm not familiar with any acronym uh, that says KMM that relates to a pattern. Um, but if that's a pattern that you can use, you can certainly use it with, uh, with Google Pay. The only thing that you need for Google Pay to, uh, to, to work or to launch is an anchor to an activity or to a view, uh, basically a context. So that can be given by an application, fragment, or activity. And I believe the, the actual good practice is to use a uh, fragment or activity. In fact, the fragment takes the activity one, but you know what I mean. 
Um, and then that's the other thing that you need, really. If you can make that work with whichever pattern you're using, that means that you can use Google Pay with that integration pattern. So I hope that answers. Thank you for the question. And back to you, Domi. Cool. So yeah, um, quick summary. I implemented the pay, finally implemented the pay method. Pay method doing two things. Again, initializing the payment, copy the code from the Stripe sheet documentation, um, calling the backend, fetching the client secret in case of success, and also fetching the publisher key. Um, the client secret gets set here. The, the publisher key will be set here. And then finally, we are able to launch the Google Pay launcher with the secret here. Now, um, in order to make this pack backend call working, I would pass it on to Paul. OK. All right. So you have now seen the good code. Now it's my turn to show you some terrible code. So I don't think uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> what I decided to do is uh, all the code that I'm going to be showing you is something that's already on the Stripe docs. But uh, what I'm going to be doing is showing you how to build the backend. I chose to do it in Node. And in particular, we're using TypeScript here because we have TypeScript bindings for our uh, Stripe Node library. Uh, I did a bit of boilerplate work here. So I'll quickly explain what I've done, and then we can move on very quickly. I'm importing three libraries here. I've got .env slash convig, which is basically going to allow me to use my environmental variables, which is this .env file you see at the top here. Uh, importing Stripe, which is our library, load library, and importing Express, which is a server library. It's very useful. What I'm doing here is I'm initializing Stripe. I am passing in my Stripe secret key. Again, this is the key that you definitely don't want to share with anyone ever, even if it is in test mode. And I'm passing in the API version. The reason I'm passing in the API version here is because when you use TypeScript, you do need to specify exactly which version of the API you're on so the TypeScript bindings work correctly. If you don't pass in this API version, it'll just default to your account's default uh, uh, API version, which might not correlate with what you're trying to do here. And then I'm creating an app, and I'm listening on port 3000. So if I run the app right now, but it's doing npm start, it runs, but it doesn't do anything else. So let's fix that. Let's start by adding a endpoint. I'm going to say payment intent, which is what Domi was talking about earlier. Uh, let's see. I'm going to make this an async function. And is Copilot turned on? Let me turn that off. Sorry about that. All right. Uh, we're going to say there's a request, which is an express request. And we have a response, which is going to be a express.response, like so. Get that function there. First thing we're going to do is we're going to create a customer. In Stripe, you, and this is going to be a type stripe.customer. Uh, yeah, and then we're going to await the Stripe API customers.create. So you usually want to create a customer because and this will then save that customer in on the Stripe side. So later, if your customer returns and they want to make a purchase, you can, for instance, if they have a payment method saved to their customer, you can fast track their whole payment process. Usually, you pass in more variables in this little create call here. Uh, I'm not going to do that today because uh, we're not going to be looking at repeat customers. That's OK. It's good, it's good practice to always create a new customer for every single payment if you don't already have this customer. So for instance, if they're signed into your app, then you might want to create a customer per user that way. Uh, so this, right, this, this, was, sorry, this creates ahead. like an anonymous customer, right? Right. This creates an anonymous customer. It'll have an ID. And it'll have nothing else about them, not even like an email address or anything. So this is just yeah. a very bare bones thing. And in a dashboard, you will be able to see a generated ID of the customer, correct? Correct. Yeah. And okay, in fact, cool. we'll, I'll show you in a moment. You'll probably see an ID. So now I'm going to create my payment intent. And that is a Stripe payment intent, like so. And we're going to await again stripe.paymentintents.create. And this time, I'm going to be passing in some variables. We're going to start with the amount, most importantly. Um, so this is going to be a number, which is in the currency that you're going to be using the lowest common denominator. Now, what does that mean? Well, let's start with currency. Let's say that I want to do this in euros. The smallest number of like uh, in, in euros, the denominator you can get is a cent, which means that this amount is going to be in cents. So if I say 1,000 like this, this represents 1,000 cents or 10 euros. 
just be, be aware that when you pass in things here, that always has to be the lowest common denominator. In most cases, in most currencies, it's going to be cents. By the way, um, I found that super convenient. Uh, you don't have to do it with uh, floating points or anything like that if you put everything in cents, which after yeah. all, like you're not going to charge anything lower than that. I think that's actually convenient. So I like that. Um, that's it's exactly why we do it. So you don't have that floating point problem because sometimes floating point math, especially in JavaScript, can be a little bit funky. Uh, right. Do be, bear in mind that there are certain currencies that don't have decimal points. Like for instance, Japanese yen uh, only have whole numbers. So the smallest value in a Japanese yen is actually one yen, not like yen cents, which doesn't exist. So they bypass the problem just like that. Right. They thought of us programmers ahead of time and uh, did us a solid. All right, so now we've got our payment intent. I'm passing in the customer here as well so that this customer is linked to this payment intent. Now remember, when I create this payment intent, this is literally just the, the, the idea that we want to make a payment. This doesn't actually move money itself. This is create the payment. That's going to happen on the client. And speaking of which, we're going to start by returning some stuff to the client. Uh, first things first, we're going to do the payment intent client secret, which we spoke about earlier. So payment intent dot client secret. And because I know Domi needs it, we're going to pass in our publishable key, which I have Thank put in my environmental variables like this. Now, I said before that the publishable key is not actually secret. So you might wonder why are you putting it in environmental variables? This, I think, is a bit of a, uh, just a good practice in general to always pass a publishable key from the server. This way, you don't have to hard code it on your client. You can just have the client tell, the server tells the client what modings to be in, either testing or production. So it's just a nice little hack. It's easier this way, I feel, to uh, store your publishable key. Let's save that. And let's start our server. And let's see if this runs. It does. Very good. So now let's open up a new window. And just to test this, we're just going to do a simple curl request to our own server. I'm going to say payment intent. And if all goes well, hooray, this returns a JSON blob with our payment intent secret ID and our publishable key, which is this thing over here. One thing that's nice about uh, Stripe object IDs is they always start with two or three characters usually describing what the thing is. So PK is publishable key, PI is, um, is payment intent. And usually it has like this, tells you whether this is in test mode or in live mode. So you don't accidentally make a mistake there. All right, so next thing what I'm gonna do, that all works, I'm gonna stop the server. I'm actually sharing a Git repository with Domi. So I'm just going to put this a, here you go, Domi. I'm going to push this and then hopefully Domi will pull on the other end and then he'll have a server that he can test against. So over to you, Domi. Live collaboration right there. So while we're on the topic of especially keys and secrets, I think I'm going to take Harry's question. I think this is a topic that um, it's, it's very important, as uh, Paul was uh, bringing up before. So let's take our time to respond to this one. Uh, so Harris is asking about any recommendations where we should be saving secret keys from Stripes. So secret, I'd say from Stripe or any other source, uh, make sure to have them in a way that it's not exposed to the public in any possible fashion. And what I mean with that is that, and I might be a bit too strict with this, I personally feel that any client that anyone can download is not a safe place to store secrets or or any sensitive information really and that is a website even a mobile application even though android and ios have done have gone a long way in in making their certain parts of their operating memory more secure i think it's still a uh, good practice uh, to keep all that information in your backend and have them one query away so examples of that depending on where you have your backend established would be simply somewhere safe in a private server so in a server that cannot be accessed from the outside that you query when you issue a request to your backend. If you're using uh, more modern tools, like for example, if you're using the cloud, there's a, there's a, a very solid and wide amount of uh, services that you can use to manage, not really store, but manage and rotate secrets, no matter uh, where you operate, uh, Azure, DigitalOcean, Google Cloud, AWS, they all have services for that. Uh, just the one thing to remember in case of doubt is simply uh, make sure that they are far away from your clients, fetch them from a safe place that cannot be accessed from the outset. That's uh, what I'd say. Yeah. One more thing I'd like to add to that, um, which is something that I've seen people do, unfortunately, is whatever you do, do not accidentally check in your secret keys into Git. Like people forget to add the .environmental file to their Git ignore list, 
and it gets checked into Git. And there are definitely people, bad actors out there who are just waiting for you to do that so they can steal your keys. And remember that um, Git history is permanent. So Correct. even if you remove the key after that, it's still in the history, right? So you'll have to, the only way to uh, deal with it is change your key uh, to a new one and avoid committing that. And uh, I would also consider redoing the repo just to make sure not to get hints that you sometimes make those mistakes. And yeah, so uh, burn it down and start over at that point. Yeah, precisely. Uh, one last one from Harshil, uh, also talking about secrets. Uh, why are you not putting uh, fetching secrets code in the view model? Um, so we that's that's actually a, one of the recommended ways of dealing with your logic on Android uh, from Android developers. So that's that's definitely a, a good um, that's good advice. We are simply keeping it as simple as we can. So that's why we're doing things in the activity. Uh, but as we were calling out before, um, feel free to use uh, feel free to go or err on the side of checking out the recommendations from Android developers and or whatever you're using for your handling your logic in your Android application. But thanks for the question. And with that, I'll bring it over to you again, Domi, if I can yes. find your screen. There you go. Thank you. Yeah, as I saw the question regarding secrets. Why not putting secrets in, into the view model? Yeah, of course. Um, this is, is the correct way. So again, um, I want to emphasize what Paul and Kose said. Don't ch change any best practices you already established um, be it fetching secrets or handling secrets in, in Android. Um, but for the sake of simplicity in this demo, I'm now actually going to remove a lot of stuff um, because now Stripe handles the whole the whole thing, so I can I can remove some 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 methods. Um, what we don't need anymore is um, like the model, the view model. Actually, in, in this demo, we don't need the model uh, at all because, again, the Stripe SDK will handle it, so I will remove it, um, which means I can also remove all those methods. Um, so you can see if by using the Stripe SDK, um, you can remove quite a lot of code. And also this one. And finally, success handling is also done by the Stripe SDK. And what's left is actually our method doing the network call to the backend. And we are going to test this one in a second. OK, that's it. Yeah, looking good. Now, now it's like a very, um, very clean. Uh, just to demo you the, the backend code, I now need to fetch the changes from, uh, from Paul. So I, I have a terminal on the app side. I have a ter terminal for the backend side. And if I pull. I guess I should receive the changes. I have to touch my security key. And now let's see if I open up the. Yeah, I received the changes. So I should be able to run the backend on my side as well. OK, so we know that Git works. Yeah. <laughs> um, it does actually, and also the server is running on port three thousand, as Paul just described a second ago. Um, let me see. So I also need to configure my local URL. I put it into build config for now. Again, also here you will have your best practices. So this is you can see this is my um, private address, and I'm reaching uh, to port three thousand where the backend is running. So let's see. This should actually do it. Um, Wanna wanna just run it, or should I put some breakpoints somewhere already? Let's let's try a clean run, drum roll, and clean run. And see what happens. Let's do it live. See what do happens. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it won't it won't work, but let's see. The natural pessimism in a developer. Build is running. Maybe a question in the meantime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just ready for that. I was waiting for you to call it, Tommy. So uh, Startup Sanatana is asking uh, whether there's an application that they can use alongside with the code to explore Google Pay integrations. So I think there's a good number of um, um, open source or samples, both on the Stripe and the Google Pay end. On our end, we do have a open source sample application with Google Pay and Google Wallet integrated. And we also have a few branches in case you have uh, concrete integration paths. Uh, they Many of them are covered there. 
So take a look at that. Is there anything you want to call out on the Stripe end, Paul? I would say that, um, as you saw from, from Dami's bits, that uh, a lot of this code is available in the Stripe docs. We also have an example app that you can find in the Stripe SDK's GitHub repo. And then finally, we have something similar to Google, where we have like a Stripe samples uh, repo, which has a bunch of examples of how to do things, including in integrating with Google Pay. Thank you. We tell right. us and Kit's question as well. So hopefully that answers. Thanks for the question. If you're curious specifically about the backend code, um, I believe that, yes, we will be uh, showing, giving you the URL to that repo after the stream. Same here for the, for the, for the Android code. We will also share th those branches with you after the call. So let's see. I'm actually clicking the button now the first time. Let's, let's see what happens. Good. OK, it crashes. All right. Uh, so Domi is a human. Finally, we know. Let's see. OK, client secret has not been in initialized. And as we know, as we learned, uh, the client secret is getting initialized in the network call to the backend here. So most likely, the result uh, does not return success. Let me debug and try again. And you can see. Oh, uh, it's okay. Clear text, clear text HTTP traffic. Yeah. Um, since this is a demo um, and we are using HTTP, we need to uh, define in the Android manifest that we are allowed to do that. Don't do this for your application, but for, for the sake of this demo, we have to actually do it. Um, so let me find the Android manifest and change it there. Because we have a local server, and hence we don't have SSL enabled on that local server. Yeah, the property is actually called uses clear text traffic. And if I set this one to true, maybe we are lucky and it works. OK, let me fire up Lockcat, clear the locks, and try to click the button again. Oh, looks a bit better. You can see that now um, we successfully fetched the secret and the key because only because of that we can uh, the, the Stripe SDK or the, the Stripe's Google Pay launcher can actually show the Google Pay sheet. And if we continue, let's see, did we actually implement something after after success? I don't think so. I think not yet, right? No, uh, the callbacks are empty. I think. Yeah, you got the call back, but they don't do anything yet. Great. OK, let's let's actually quickly at least handle the success case. And I'm going to cheat here for a second because I know we have a success case implemented for our application. Um, it's, it's, it's actually switching to a success activity. Um, uh, yeah. Let's Going see. back to the KMM question. Uh, thank you for clarifying. There's also com some comments that KMM stands for Kotlin Multiplatform. Oh, um, I see. I hadn't played with it in the past. So thanks for, for clarifying. Now on whether Google Pay will be available there, there if Kotlin Multiplatform supports multiple platforms as per the what the acronym says, just note that Google Pay is not as part of Google Play services. It's not available on, on iOS today. Um, and so... I haven't tested it, but I would guess if it works in any way, it would be only on the Android side. It wouldn't work on iOS because that's not available at the moment. And I do hope that answers. Thanks for uh, clarifying the question. Thanks, Jose. OK, let's do it one more time. Uh, for now, we are just handling the success case. As you can see, canceled and failed are not handled. We can handle them later on if needed. Just because you know it's going to work, right? Well, yeah, I'm, now I'm pretty confident, to be honest. There we mm. go. Hey. It took a bit. It took a bit of time. Now let's switch over to the Stripe dashboard to actually confirm if we see the transaction. And um, maybe this one. I'm missing. Oh, here. Yeah. Timestamp looks good. So this is actually our transaction we, we, we just did. Um, one thing I want to mention here, because Paul kind of touched it um, a minute ago. 
So if you if you look up the transaction in the Stripe dashboard, you will also see um, the calls being made. So you can see here that a um, payment intent was created. So this was done by Pulse backend. And you can see that um, confirmation was done automatically. Um, this is because um, I think Paul, please correct me if I'm wrong, but this is because um, we are not saying that we want to have manual completion. And if we look at the response, Stripe's response of creating a payment intent, you can see that here the capture method is, is automatic. So it means that the co confirmation will, ho will happen automatically. So nothing um, to do from your side. Correct. So um, it's unusual, but it is possible if you wanted to do capt manual capturing, is what we call it where the payment is essentially confirmed on the client, but the actual movement of funds from your, uh, basically from your credit card to the, uh, to the Stripe account is then manually completed on the server. It requires an extra step, an extra round trip to the server. There are a few cases where that might be useful. Like for instance, if you want to hold the, the funds in reserve, but not actually charge yet. But for almost all cases, you do want it automatic confirmation, which is why it's also the default. Makes By sense. the way, kudos on the on the dashboard. I was uh, last time I checked it, I was testing uh, test cards end to end with uh, with Stripe, and uh, it's just so helpful to be able to see the entire payload and the the whole chronology as well. So, uh, yeah, definitely, definitely, I think it's Thank a you. fantastic. Yeah, well, the best thing about the the dashboard is just for developers. It does have like a huge log of exactly what happened, which is fantastic for debugging. Okay, so before we move on, Jose, Paul, what do you think? I, I would like to show one more thing, which is actually a failing transaction and handling the, 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 the error case. Would that be okay for you guys? Absolutely. Go for it. Don't you don't blame my code. <laughs> okay, so um, we, the Android quick start, uh, quick start app already had a handle error message, uh, handle error function. I'm reusing this one to just for now, just lock the, the actual uh, message if um, something went wrong. Uh, and I think it's uh, stripe re result dot error message. So now, be, and the reason why I want to show this to you is, um, if you closely paid attention to the sheet, um, we are supporting now PSP defined test card. So when clicking on a payment method, you will notice that the sheet actually shows all the all the test cards Stripe offers. So you will find, actually, you will find those cards in the Stripe documentation under test cards. Um, we have support for all of them. And we also have support for um, cards resulting in errors. So for example, let's actually do expire card in this case and try again. So we are now not starting the success activity and hopefully landed here. Let's see. Actually, did I rebuild? I think I did not rebuild, right? Did you guys pay no. attention? No, I, I think you rebuilt. You just hit back. Tracking every movement. Thanks. OK, one more time. So expire card. Check locket. And if you now can see that. Um, the card is expired. So this gives you the opportunity to test the, the error cases as well, which is uh, super nice. Now to, to verify, let's double check in the Stripe dashboard. And you can see um, we already have two, two um, failed attempts, which is super nice. And uh, just like security, I think this is a topic that it's it's worth stressing out, stressing out and spending time on. Uh, I think being able to test all the multiple payment flows before you go to production is uh, not only very much recommended, but highly encouraged. Uh, this means now that with uh, test cards from, in this case, from Stripe, you can tell all those flows, you can test all those flows which are supported. And again, that's cards from countries, that's uh, errors due to uh, a decline card, insufficient funds, fraud, there's, there's a, a whole variety of them. So that means that you can build, uh, this is something you can automate, by the way. So you can build your automated um, test cases, a full suite, uh, with this, using this, so that when you go into production, you have uh, full confidence that your customers, those who who um, incur in successful but also 
transactions with errors, they will have a nice payment experience in your application. So uh, please do take a look. Uh, we think that this is uh, worthwhile investing time on. Yeah, you can find all the details here in the documentation under test with sample credit cards under the gateway test cards section. We have at the moment we have support for those PSPs. Um, yeah, again, supporting all their cards from their documentation side. I'll just say that from the Stripe side, we have a huge amount of test cards for pretty much any situation you can imagine, uh, all available on our in our docs uh, under the testing section. There's a lot to go on there. Great, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, that's that's the list where you can where you can check all the different cards. Yeah. yeah. And for every different brand of card as well, if you're interested. Yes, it, yeah. it took us a while to to add those cards, Paul, to our configuration. Good. <laughs> and test them as well, one by one. Fair enough. So what do we do now? That's the question. Um, some questions to... from the audience? Or I offer two options. Okay. Uh, yeah, there's a couple of questions that we can I can I can go ahead and take in a second. But then for our next potential integration path, I suggest either we try the payment sheet now that we are in um, in, in the code already in, in Android Studio, or we look at uh, webhook confirmation of the payments. Oh, yes. Let's actually, Paul, do you agree? Let's actually have a look at webhooks. Yes, no problem. We can do that. So. Um, right, so let me first explain what webhooks are, just in case anyone is not familiar with them. Webhooks are a way of Stripe informing you about your something that's happened on your Stripe account. So for instance, if someone is uh, on their phone and they pay for something in the way we just described here, uh, but then they happen to like lose connection or lose Wi-Fi or whatever, and you never they never get the response from uh, in the app that says that your payment has completed. That doesn't necessarily mean the payment wasn't completed, just that they didn't see the notification. So rather than relying on the client to basically then send a message back to your server to say, hey, this person paid, we should instead rely on something called webhooks. Now, webhooks, again, is basically just a post from Stripe servers to your server to let you know what happened. And we always recommend that you use webhooks because that way, whatever happens on the client, it doesn't matter. You will always be informed of the thing that happened, and you can then proceed to doing your payment fulfillment without the need of the client at all. So if we right. uh, switch over to me, I can do a really super quick webhook, uh, a very fast webhook integration. OK, here we go. So let me, we only got a few minutes left. So let me be quick about this. So let's start with a new root on our server, and we'll just call it webhook. And why does Kogan keep turning on? That's cheating. That's I, don't, I don't think we necessarily have a hard uh, deadline poll, just in case oh, if you do have okay. time, we can and you can use it. We can we can code uh, with um, ease. OK, perfect. Right. Well, then I want to show a couple of tricks then, just so I give everyone their best practices. So first thing we're going to do here in Express is we're actually going to um, set up a little middleware. If you're not familiar with Express, and why would you be? Because I'm assuming there's mostly Android developers here. We're basically saying we need to do an extra step before the request hits this endpoint. And what we need here is to have a, what's called a body parser. Uh, this means that we want our code to treat the payload from the webhook in a specific way. And what we want here is the raw request from Stripe. So let's say application JSON. The reason we want the raw request, I'll get to in a little bit, is because we're using some tricky things with crypto, not crypt cryptography, that is, and uh, <laughs> signatures to make sure that no one can, can do nasty things, which we'll get to. So next, we're going to create the function here. This is going to be async. This will be as before uh, requests, request.request, and response. So. We have our webhook endpoint. However, um, this raw request we are saying for here, that's for this, em this endpoint, this endpoint only. However, it's very lucky that for the rest of your application, you likely want to use JSON for everything else. So you might do something like app.use and then express.json, for instance. What this basically means is that you're installing this middleware, which says that for every single route, it first tries to parse the body as JSON before it does the thing that's in your code, um, which is normally what you want to do. But that's going to break 
this over here, because what's going to happen is that the request is going to, the body is going to be JSON encoded first, and then we're going to try and do this raw encoding on it, and it's going to mess up the uh, cryptography in it. So we first need to tell Express not to do that. And how we're going to do that is we're actually going to define a, our own little function over here with, let's copy paste this, I keep typing it. So what they're saying is do this bit between doing anything else first. And what we're going to do is a quick and easy check. We're going to say if our original URL, so whatever the thing is that we're hitting, if this is our webhook, I forgot something here, by the way. We also need a next function, which is an express dot next function. If the root that we're hitting is webhook, then we just go ahead. We do nothing because we want the, the body to be a, a, a raw response. And else, we actually want to use this JSON parser. So this is just a function. So we're going to call that function, and we're going to pass in all the other variables up here. So what, what this basically means is that if someone hits forward slash payment intent, the body will be automatically JSON encoded. And if they hit forward slash webhook, the body stays raw which is relevant because the first thing that we're going to be doing when we go in here is we're going to try and grab the signature, which is just going to be a simple string. And that is included in the headers of this request. And it's going to be uh, Stripe signature. Oops. And TypeScript is complaining. Oh, because it needs me to cast this as a string like so. Then we're going to create our event. We leave it at that, and we're actually going to use a try catch for this next bit, because we're now going to basically try to construct the event that came from Stripe service. Now this can go wrong for a variety of reasons. One thing, for instance, if you don't have the right webhook uh, signing secret, which again we'll get to in a little bit, or if there is what's called a man in the middle attack. So the the danger of having a webhook is because this is exposed to the entire the internet is that someone who's malicious could, for instance, hit your webhook endpoint with data that seems like it's coming from Stripe, but is not. So what we want is to make sure that everything that comes in here has come from Stripe and nowhere else, so no one's trying to fraud you. And to do that, we're first going to construct our event. Webhooks.construct event. This is going to take the payload, which is just the rec.body. And then we need the signature, which we defined earlier. And then finally, we need our um, Stripe oops, webhook. Let's see, is that what I named it? Yes. And that's a string as well. You might be wondering, where's the Stripe webhook secret coming from? Don't worry, we'll get to that as well. But we're going to try and create the webhook, the event here. And if that doesn't work, we actually want to catch this error. And TypeScript wants me this to be any. And we're just going to return res.status 400. And we'll send a message as well, just saying um, web, web signature mismatch, like so. So let's save that. And let's give that a test. So over here, let me. Start. Oh, wait, yeah. So let me let me show you what happens if it fails. So let's do npm start. So my server is running, and if I now do curl local host thousand and webhook, it's probably going to be like yeah. Oh, cannot get. Uh -huh. My bad. Oh, gee, tell you what, we'll use the Stripe CLI instead. That's a much better idea. So. Uh, one thing, if you have not familiar with Stripe, actually has their own CLI. Uh, which you can download, it's open source. And what we're going to do is we're going to listen for webhooks from the internet, and we're going to forward it to the local host, like so. What this does is Stripe is now going to set up a uh, an endpoint, basically, that's, that's readily available on the internet, and it's going to forward that to our local host running locally. And you'll notice here that it actually spat out the webhook signing secret. So I'm purposefully not going to use that right now, because I want to show you what it looks like when it, when it fails. Now we're going to start CLI again, and we're going to trigger a, an event. So I'm going to say payment intent that's exceeded. 
what this is going to do is the Stripe CLI is going to create a fake payment and uh, it's going to show up in my Stripe account. And this is going to uh, trigger my webhook code as well. So I hit enter. So that succeeded, but we should hopefully see here, yeah, 400. And ah, the reason we don't see anything on our server is because we forgot to log the error here as well. So let's do that at our server. By the um, way, it's something that you will want to log to your uh, telemetry systems to know if the, there's been attempts of um, you know, misusing your, your endpoint. Yeah. So we got uh, an error here. And uh, I'll have to keep scrolling somewhere. But it's like you to see error message is that there is a uh, mismatch in signature. Let me just quickly do that. Make this a bit clearer. Start that. Get our payment again. No signatures found matching the expected signature for payload. Are you passing the role request body you received from Stripe? So basically what it's saying is that we don't, we cannot construct this event because we don't have everything that we need. So let's fix that. Let's grab this webhook signing secret that I had before. And we're going to put that in our dot environmental variables. As you can see, I've hidden everything else because you got to keep things secret. Uh, we'll go over here. We will restart our server because now we do have our Stripe webhook secret. What's probably going to happen is we're going to see nothing because there's no error to be had, which is about right. OK, so this works. As in, we have this event that does something. Now let's actually do something with it. And this will be the last part that we do is we're going to look at the event type. I'm going to say case with the event that we care about. In this case, is payment intent succeeded. So a payment was successfully made. Let's grab the payment intent itself, which is going to be stripe.paymententent. And this equals the events.object.data. Oop, pad start data. Um, oh, sorry, I got it wrong around. Event.data.object as stripe.payment event. And to do something with that, let's say console.log payment succeeded for amount. And we'll say payment intent dot amount. Bray. Awesome. Let's break here so I don't break anything here. And then let's make sure at the end, before we try and test it, is we do actually have to return a status. So send status 200. So that the Stripe API knows that the webhook event was actually received. All right, let's save that. At the server. Let's trigger a payment. Oh, payment succeeded for amount 2000. Hooray. And if we look over at our um, over here, you'll notice that we have a lot of errors up here saying that client time exceeded while waiting headers. It's because we didn't have that return status up ahead, but we said it returns to 200. So that timed out. So as far as the Stripe API is concerned, that webhook never arrived. Now you have to be careful to always send back a 200 response because if you don't, then Stripe is going to consider that a lost webhook, and it's going to keep retrying until it works. And eventually, after it's exhausted all its retries, it's just going to give up and email you and say, hey, your server's busted. So make sure you always send back this 200 response. OK, so that is webhooks. And then after this, basically in here, the switch case statement, this is where you would probably put you know, your business logic of like what to do next. So purchase fulfillment, uh, fulfillment, you want to send an email, you want to onboard someone. That's what happens here. And then here in the switch, you might want to add more stuff here as well, like payment failed. Thank you, Cobalt. And then do stuff here if there's something there. Very cool, Paul. I really like it when we show best practices and we talk about security as well, and we, we make it part of the conversation. I think that was great. Uh, by the way, Ulubeg is asking, uh, not that one, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Trupix YouTube is asking, what kind of terminal ext extension you're using, Paul? Oh, oh, great question. Oh, what's it called again? Oh, it's really good as well. <laughs> um, well, the font is called Menlo, I believe. And I'm using ZSH. That's right. I'm using Same ZSH, here, yeah. which you can find, I think, just zsh.sh website is my extension. Mm -hmm. And uh, it has a bunch of themes there as well. And I'm using one of those fancy ones. Great demo, by the way. Thank you for that. No we have one more thing that we'll have to choose whether we do or not. Um, that is payment sheet. 
uh, while you think about it, we have been secretly talking, Domi and I, Paul, uh, so while, while you think about it and, and decide whether we go for it or not, I can go ahead and take some questions. And one of them is whether you can change the payment amount later on. So I guess, Coreflow Dev, you're asking about whether after creating the payment intent, you can change the amount. Yeah. I'll probably let Paul respond to that one. Sure. So uh, when you create the payment intent, you are not able to adjust the amount afterwards. And, uh, but that's okay, because bear in mind that the moment that you're presenting the payment sheet or in our initial in integration, you're showing the Google Pay sheet, um, people have already decided they want to buy and they're clicking the button to say, I'm ready to purchase. So at that point, you should already know the amount that you want to charge them. So it doesn't really make sense at that point to then go back and change it. If you needed to go back and change it, you would just create a new payment intent instead. That's what I thought. Thank you. Uh, Edson is asking uh, whether they would need to use the API directly or they can use a client SDK if they want to make their own UI implementation. That's something that we briefly, briefly touched on at the beginning. There's a few integration paths that you can, uh, you can go with, uh, both on the Google Pay, using the Google Pay library or the Stripe libraries. If you're using Stripe and you want to build your, your UI the way you like in a custom way, we recommend using the Google Pay Launcher. That is, you'll be able to build your checkout form in a way that looks consistent to your to your UI, to, to your user interface. And the Google Pay Launcher, again, from the Stripe SDK on Android, will allow you to uh, plug in the Google Pay button right there. So no need to use the API directly. You can use the client SDK, which is a bit more of a, it's a bit nicer developer experience. All right. How All do right. you feel, Domi and Paul? Do we do the so, payment sheet? Yeah. So my suggestion is, um, I, I would love to try out the webhook uh, code Paul just did. However, um, I suggest that Paul, you can go ahead and quickly create a backend endpoint for the payment sheet, and then push everything together, and then I can try out everything on my side. What do you think? No problem. I can actually do that very quickly because. Great. Let me show you. Let me just get rid of this. So we're not going to need that. We'll just uh, pretend like nothing ever breaks in our integration. So what I'm gonna do is to create a payment sheet. It is very similar code to the payment intent code that we had. So I'm just gonna take this and we're gonna copy it. I'm gonna change the endpoint to be payment sheet, like so. We still need a customer. We still have a payment intent. We're gonna be charging the same amount. We're just adding one additional thing here, which is kind of interesting to talk about, which is something called an ephemeral key. So let me create that ephemeral key. Again, GitHub, stop, leave me alone, stop turning on again. Uh, and this is the stripe.ephemeral key. So quick description, what is this? Well, as we said before, uh, there are certain operations you can only do with a Stripe secret key and certain things you can do with a Stripe publishable key. Sometimes you might want your client, in this case, most using like a mobile device, to be able to form an action that can only be done with a secret key. Uh, you could, just keep making calls to your backend, but that's expensive. So we have this concept of a thing called an ephemeral key. What this is, is this is essentially a highly restricted secret key. It's only able to make very few, very certain specific operations. Uh, it's constrained to like one specific event or event thing or a special object type. And it's time limited, which means that I think if I remember correctly, it's got about 10 minutes of lifespan before it's invalidated and you can't use it anymore. So, it's meant to be a secure way of being able to perform actions on the client. Now, as to why we need this ephemeral key, let me go ahead and start by creating it by saying stripe.ephemeralkeys.create. I'm going to pass in some options here. I'm actually passing in the customer.id because I want this particular ephemeral key to be able to access certain uh, things from the customer, certain like properties about them. The reason for that is that the payment sheet is, uh, tries to be clever. And if your customer has a payment method already saved on Stripe, then the payment sheet wants to present that to the customer as they're paying. Because they, the faster they can like, use like a, a saved card, for instance, or a saved payment method, the quicker they can get through the whole process. What I'm also going to do is, because this is an ephemeral, this is actually like a key, I'm going to tie this to an API version, which is 2000, that's the 15th of November. So this is going to create me an ephemeral key that I'm going to pass back to Domi's side as well. 
Uh, and the next thing that I'm going to do here is going to make a quick change to the payment intent creation. We're going to keep the amount, the currency, and the customer. But what we're going to add is something called automatic payment methods, which is an object. And we say enabled is true. Now, what this means is that if automatic payment methods is enabled, then this payment intent, when it's in the payment sheet, will automatically display every single payment method that's already been activated on your Stripe account. So it'll show Google Pay, it'll show Ideal, it'll show Bank Contact if all those things are activated. You can choose not to do this and be very specific about which ones you want by having passing in a payment methods array, which says, you know, I only want to show Ideal, for instance. But for most people, we think that automatic payment methods is kind of the way to go. Um, we, auto, we, we, we enable it here rather than early on Google Pay because Google Pay only has cards in it. Whereas for the payment sheet, you might want these other payment methods. So after that's done, I'm just going to add here. I'm going to add the customer to so just the ID of the customer so the payment sheet knows which customer it's interested in. And I'm going to add the ephemeral key. So ephemeral key dot secret, like so. Let me save that. Let's restart the server. And then I test that by just running curl uh, local host 3000 payment sheet. Now I should hopefully, hooray, I've got payment intents. I've got a publishable key. I've got a customer ID, which looks like that. And I've got my ephemeral key, this EK test. And that should be everything that Domi needs to implement the payment sheet on his end. So let me do git commit. Here you go again, Domi and push that up. All right, back to you, Dummy. Thanks, Paul. All right, while you pull that, Dummy, uh, let's take a couple of questions. Uh, Uluk Beck is asking, can we use Google Pay with Stripe to implement subscriptions? The answer is yes. What Google Pay does is facilitates the handling of the payment method from the customer into the processor, in this case, Stripe. Uh, and then the anything that has to do with the, with the flows of money, you will do that with Stripe in this case. And so that, that will be like a secondary or like a, a processing time configuration that you will uh, that you will enable or that you configure with a Stripe. So the answer, the short answer is yes. I don't know if there's any uh, additional config that or any facilitation that you do uh, on, your, on your end, Paul, uh, but I think that's the basics, right? Yeah, absolutely right. That's the basics. The answer is yes, you can do it. Jose, we should uh, do one okay. session about subscriptions. Yeah. Probably. Um, we are calling for votes, by the way. If you're interested, I'll leave a plus one or a comment in the chat and we'll consider. Great. All right. Um, so first things first, um, I cheated again. I, I switched uh, to the Stripe payment sheet branch. Uh, I have a full integration there already done. However, once again, it's really, I followed the documentation. Um, basically copy the code from, from the payment sheet documentation on Stripe site um, here in order to complete the payment sheet integration. So it's really similar to the Google Pay Launcher integration. If we quickly check, uh, check the code, uh, so instead of, uh, of the Google Pay Launcher object, you, have, you actually have a, sorry, uh, you have a payment sheet. Was right, it? Okay. Go, on. Go on. No, I was just saying that I, I could see it in your code. Yeah, sorry. Instead of a, a Google Pay Launcher object, you have a payment sheet object, and the, you can see the configuration similar. And um, what Paul just did, just did, we can use again in our networking method. So this integration needs a couple of more secrets, um, and we are setting them again inside our initialized payment method um, uh, here and here. All the other things are really sim similar. So Stripe did a really good job to um, make sure that that's easy for, for users. Um, you also have noticed that on the right-hand side, if you look at the screen, um, I changed to a generic pay button because now we are going to trigger the payment sheet and no longer um, only Google Pay. So that's that. those are the changes I had to do for a payment sheet integration. Um, now, let me pull... Paul's changes for the backend as a first step. And I will also actually let me run it. And finally, I will also set, set up the webhook listener. Um, can do it here. Okay. 
All right. Um, now let me try to trigger the payment sheet. Oh, looking good. Hooray. Yeah, looks good. So yeah, um, compared to, to the direct Google Pay launch integration before, this now obviously will, will spawn the payment sheet. And now if I click the pay with Google Pay button, you will see the additional Google Pay sheet. And now I'm switching back to a card, to a success card, uh, maybe the, four two, the famous 42421. And finally, do the payment. There we go. And if we double check on Stripe's side, let's see One, once more, you can see that there it is. The payment is done. And maybe we can even, ha even have an identifier saying that it was the, the sheet. I'm not quite sure, maybe here. Oh, no, it won't say that in the API response, no. No? Unfortunately not. It'll just tell you that it's a payment intent and a lot of other details, but I won't tell you if it came from the payment sheet. All right, got it, cool. Yeah, but that is something that you could add yourself by just when you create the payment intent, you can add metadata that says, you know, this is a payment for oh. mobile, for instance. And that Great. will show up in the API afterwards. I see. Cool. Yeah. And this concludes our two different integrations. One, uh, again, if you have, for example, if you have the dynamic Google Pay button or a special um, requirements for your UI, you have the possibility to use the Google Pay launcher. Or on the other hand, as just shown, if you want to use... Um, uh, the easier way where you see all the payment methods configured on Stripe side, you are using the payment sheet. Yeah, hopefully you could see that difference uh, live with the great work that uh, Paul and Domi did on an almost flawless integration. Well, two integrations, I have to say. Marcus is asking whether they can issue a refund automatically if a good or service cannot be delivered. And I think this is in context of the payment intent that we were talking about before. Uh, changing the amount so let's say what would happen if i let's let's just use an example i book a ride on a um on a uh, sharing economy app um and then i'm given like an estimated price of eight euro and then i do the ride and it turns out to be 9.2 then what would be the right approach from the processing end as in like uh, how to refund a certain amount of it how you refund that in case it was wrong or like Marcus is saying, maybe the, the uh, shipment couldn't be done. Right. So in the case of like a good service cannot be delivered, like if you ordered something, but then it turns out that you don't have the thing in stock, for instance, uh, Dom is already showing here, there's a refund button that's on the dashboard, but this refund is also available in the API. So uh, you can programmatically refund things as you get them as well, if you want. Um, if you're talking about like uh, uh, the, the, like the Lyft or the Uber or ride sharing um, method, what you essentially you do is you do a manual capture and you capture less than the amount that you tried to uh, 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 confirm. So for instance, if you estimate something is gonna be between let's say 10 and 15 euros, uh, you might be on the safe side and you actually set up a payment intent for 20 euros instead just in case it goes over. And once the ride is completed, you only capture the 15 euros and the rest of it remains uncaptured and eventually gets released back to the user's credit card. Thank you for the question, Marcus. Definitely like something that, that uh, could happen repeatedly. So it's definitely good to know. Orville is asking uh, whether they can do in-person payments with Stripe and Google Pay. And uh, let me just say that this <laughs> is, uh, this is uh, we're doing completely the other end. We're, we're in, the, in the digital world. So we are, we are covering uh, the online APIs. But I guess if I've heard before that Stripe have a, has a point of sale, I guess in theory, you could do in-person payments with Stripe and Google Pay. You could use your NFC chip in your phone and then the point of sale. Ah, it actually works on your phone. Does it, is it, does sure. it use uh, CPOC? Ooh, excellent question that I do not know the answer to. Um, <laughs> we, you, have two op you have two options basically for, using, for collecting payments in person. One is this recently announced tap to pay on Android, which turns every single phone that you have, if, if it's a right version, uh, into a, a, a point of sale device. Or we have something called Stripe Terminal, which is where you actually have a separate device which you can then use to collect payments in person. Uh, so if you just Google Stripe Terminal, then you'll find that. And there's, there's a bunch of different options for you there. Or try tap to pay on Android, because that's the latest and greatest thing. 
have to pay under was was what I was talking about. I think the underlying technology is called CPOC. That was what I was trying to do too. That's really cool. So you can tap from a phone onto a phone to pay physically, I guess. Yes. Right. Yes. Interesting. All right. Thank you, everyone, for the question. This is coming to an end, but uh, let me take a couple more questions uh, because I think we had like a really good number there's, of them. Uh, there's a, there's a one more topic, Paul. You have to mention. Right? You want to mention, right? Yeah, I would love to show you guys a little sneak peek of something that we've been working on that is still very much in like an alpha state, but I just want to kind of kind of tease everyone with this new thing that we're working on. Okay, so let's let's go with this one and then we go for the uh secret news. Maybe that's not the the best way to flag it, but you know, something cool. Core Dev is asking whether Google Pay is suitable for e-commerce for an e-commerce website. I'd say that that's precisely a place where it's very suitable. Um, remember, they are, we are talking in the context of uh, online payments. Even though we are covering Android in this episode, there's also a web SDK. So I'd say uh, this is the right means of payment to use. Uh, you may have heard or you may know that there's two different ways to pay with, uh, let's say, with, with Google resources or with, with Google products. One of them is called Google Play Billing. And the other one, the one that we are talking about here is Google Pay. Google Play Billing is uh, is meant to be for payments that are in the context of the Google Play Store. So if you have an application and you are selling digital goods there, then you need to use it's uh, it, it's part of the terms of service that you use Google Play Billing. Uh, that again is subject to the uh, Play Store uh, terms of service. If you are operating outside of that, so for example, physical goods, um, anywhere else on the internet, for example, you're selling t-shirts, uh, you're doing food delivery, you're ordering a cab ride, then you can use Google Pay uh, to facilitate payments with a payment processor. So if we take the example of the episode today, you can use Google Pay with Stripe to power payments in your e-commerce uh, website. So I'd say it's actually the right tool. Yes, it, yes, it is. And to add on that very, very briefly, if it's if your question is specifically mm -hmm. about editing an order before delivery, you can also do that with with Google Pay. Remember, um, Google Pay just does the facilitation. So we 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 um, we create a token, and after that, you can work with your payment service provider like Stripe to you know adjust amount uh, um, during the authorization, adjust amount during confirmation, do refunds, refunds, and so on and so forth. Thank you for the question. And now, Paul, I'm excited. So um, what is it that you have for us? Is it the first time that this has been announced elsewhere in the world? Well, it's not the first time being announced, but this is the first time actually showing a little demo of it, which is very, very cool. So uh, if you, so I'm showing my screen. If you script switch over to mine rather than dummies, I'll give a preamble. So uh, during Stripe sessions, which is our yearly conference uh, earlier, this year, we announced something called Workbench. Now, Workbench is kind of our next generation developer tool to help you build your Stripe integrations easier. So uh, this is a Stripe dashboard, a special account that, uh, that I have here. At the bottom, you see we have this new kind of funky looking thing called Workbench. And if I click on that, it brings up this new screen, which is going to tell you a lot of information about your Stripe account. Specifically, it's going to tell you more about the, uh, the, the API and how you're using it. This is a test account, so there's not a huge amount going on here, but we do have things like graphs telling you, you know, how what percentage of your uh, requests are failing versus what is working. But uh, what's really interesting here is that it also tells you like what your latest error was. And like in this case, I had some rate limiting errors, and it tells you how to fix it. So if I go over to the logs, and I'm also I should note that this is very much pre-alpha, so there's probably things that might not, may or may not work. Um, but uh, we're working on it. If I go over to logs, it actually just shows me everything that's going on in my Stripe account. So in this case, like, you know, where I created a payment intent, it shows me the exact response body. And I can actually can click into one of these objects to kind of get more information about them. This also lets me do some fun stuff like only filter on the failed stuff. Uh, so for instance, here, this checkout session, uh, it shows me exactly the error that I had, and it tells me how to find it. But what I really want to show you, I think is pretty cool, uh, two things actually. So if I go over to my payments page, and then I open up this random payment I see here, I can click over to inspector, and this will show me the context of where what's happening on my screen here. And what's really nice here is that this will not just show me like the, the API response, but also I can actually click into these things. Like for instance, if I wanna see what's like more about the charge, it actually will retrieve that for me. I click the balance transaction and retrieve these from the API so I can see exactly what happened. 
and it'll show me like logs and events, et cetera, as well. And one last thing I want to show um, is that we actually have integrated the Stripe shell into this as well. So if I click on the bottom here, this is actually the Stripe CLI that I showed you earlier. It's actually available right here. So if I do Stripe trigger payments intent succeeded, which is the same thing we had before with some autocompletes, this is actually running in your browser. And as you can see, the trigger succeeded. So if I click show details, it's going to show me the request. Let me bring this up a bit of exactly what happened down here. And if I go back to my payments here, we should notice that this top thing here is the payment that I just created. So this is brand new, something called Workbench. Um, it's not live yet, obviously. We're still working on it. We're hard at work on it. If you would like to participate in this in an upcoming beta, uh, please let us know by going to workbench.stripe.dev which where you can sign up to be uh, part of the beta for this. We're really excited to show you more of this stuff. It's probably going to be a little bit while before we can generally launch it. But if you sign up to the beta program, you can get a sneak peek at what's going on here. That looks great. Thank you, Paul. All right. Thanks for sharing, sharing it here for the first time. Fantastic. Yeah, it looks good. Uh, can we take a look when uh, it's ready for beta? Uh, no, you have to sign up. Absolutely All not. Right. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll take my we'll question in the queue. Thank you for sharing that, Paul. And uh, with that, I think we have covered a good, good amount of, uh, of content already. Let me go through a couple last comments, and then we can wrap it up after that. But um, I have to say I'm impressed with uh, the work that you have uh, put together, Tommy and Paul. Lucas is asking whether they need to pay a sales fee to the Play Store if they integrate Google Pay. So that alludes to the distinction that we were making before between Google Play billing and then Google Pay. You don't have to pay uh, any fee for Google Pay. It's a free service. Uh, and so you simply integrate the API to facilitate the payment. You send that to your processor, you process the payment, and that comes at no cost uh, for you, uh, again, on the Google Pay end. And finally, I have a question way up there. Abby, hope you're still here. Uh, if not, Sorry yeah. for having taken like that now. Uh, so you're asking for a flatter Google Pay, I guess, video or course or tutorial. We do have, in fact, one tutorial. We have one live stream like this one that we run a couple months back on the Flutter channel. So take a look at that. We're integrating the Pay plugin on Flutter. And it's a similar format. So we are doing that uh, with the code in front of you so you can see how, how to do it. So take a look, check it out, and leave us some comments if you have any, any question. But uh, I hope that you enjoy that. And with that, I think we can wrap it up. Wow, again, like two integration paths, a client side, a backend with two endpoints, and a webhook, a product premiere from Stripe. That was a lot. I'm, in fact, I'm feeling very much accomplished, even though. It was, it was, I, I didn't do much of it. It was you, Paul, and Domi doing a great job. Um, I have to say that I'm, I'm happy that I witnessed it at least. So thank you. How did it feel? It felt good. Hopefully everyone learned something. Uh, if not, hit me up on Twitter and uh, we can go over more of this stuff. And thank you very much to both you, Jose and Domi. Yeah, it was hey, super cool. Yeah. Thank you so much. You have our uh, Twitter handles right there on screen right now. So as Paul says, use them. We are here to help you as a developer advocate or developer relations engineer. So one last time, thank you to all of you. Uh, thank you uh, to our guests and to my co-host, Tommy, in showing you how to make the most out of your Google Pay and, and Stripe integration. Let us know if there are integration paths or topics for the future that you really think that we should cover. We have the comments right now. And we have the comments on YouTube in the future, and you have the Twitter channel. So uh, the very reason why we're doing this is to make your integration uh, experiences easier and more convenient. We will continue to invite your favorite payment gateways to complete the Google Pay integration in upcoming episodes as well. So if you have a preference on who to invite next, let us know in the comments, and we'll make our best to bring them in. And with that said, this was live Google Pay integrations on Android with Google Pay DevRel and today with Stripe. So have a great day. Until next time. Bye-bye.